No. I haven't even seen it's that. Probably squash vine borer has got into the base of the stem. Where's the base of the stem? Hello everyone, Kay here on my homestead in Tennessee. Very hot and sweaty after a whole walk around with the local UT Extension agent answering all the questions I could think of. He made a house call today with two of his associates and offered his opinion and advice on many of the issues I'm facing, so stay tuned. Well, my name is Lucas Holman. I'm the County Director of the Wilson County UTTSU Extension Office, which is located in Lebanon, Tennessee. And I'm over here today visiting Kay for a little bit, and we wanted to chat a little bit about peaches. And a lot of the peach questions that we get in Tennessee are geared towards Zone 7 production, because most of Middle Tennessee, where we're at, is Zone 7. Now, if you grow peaches in Tennessee, you're going to find out quickly that they're extremely difficult to grow, as with any other stone fruit. Plums, cherries, nectarines, apricots, all those stone fruits can be just a little bit difficult because of the disease pressure that we have in Tennessee. Now, Tennessee is blessed with 100% humidity and 95 degree temperatures most of the summer long. And that <laughs> thrives on a lot of these diseases on some of these peach trees. But when we're talking about peach cultivars for Tennessee, we have a lot of great peach orchards that are in Tennessee. We recommend cultivars that have a thousand or more chill hours. And a lot of these peaches are white fleshed peaches. So you may see names like white nectar, China pearl. Those seem to do a little bit better in Tennessee because they bloom later. So a lot of the peaches that we get shipped up from Georgia or South Carolina, they, are, they usually have chill hour requirements of less than a thousand hours. So they'll be 800, 900 hours. If we plant some of those peaches here in Tennessee, we get a warm snap the first week of March, they're gonna flush out blooms. And then usually the first week of April in Tennessee, we're gonna get hit with a frost and it's gonna kill those blooms off. And that's almost like you get a good year every three or four years for peaches in Tennessee. But if we're growing the right cultivars of peaches, they'll do fine if we select the ones that are a thousand more chill hours. Now, if you're growing peaches in Tennessee, we chatted a minute ago about disease pressure and you're gonna have plenty of insect pressure also you need to stick to some kind of a spray schedule for insects and diseases. So peaches have a bug named after them called the lesser peach tree borer. If you're growing peaches in Tennessee, you're going to get the lesser peach tree borer. You need to kind of stick up with some kind of a game plan for what type of insecticides you're going to use. And then when we're looking at disease pressure, we're going to be looking at the big one that happens on the fruit called brown rot. So you're going to have to be using some fungicides for that. We generally recommend some copper fungicides or some captans and they have restrictions on how many days you can spray them and how many days you can spray them before you harvest the fruit. When we're growing peaches also, the number one thing you need to do is prune them correctly in February. You need to cut out that central leader. Sunlight needs to hit the center of the tree at lunchtime. We like sunlight to hit the middle of the tree because it kind of airs out the tree. It dries off any leaves where disease can come in. When we're looking at some of the organic options for, fe for peach production, it's extremely difficult to see organic peaches for sale in the store because they are hard to do. When we're looking at organic options for fungicides, it's usually some type of a copper fungicide mixture. Now those don't have the residual and the strength as some of the synthetic mixtures that we use. So a lot of the fungicides and insecticides that we use for food production have been tested and they've been tried and true for a long time. When we look at some of these options, the labels are the law and they'll actually say what you can spray and what you cannot spray. And it's really interesting to me because we don't spray anything while it's flowering. So sometimes people will ask, can I spray this fungicide when their peaches are fully in bloom? We don't encourage that because that's when we knock back our pollinators. But we have a lot of organic options that just aren't as safe as synthetic. So I think about spinosad, which is an organic option for insects in the garden. If you read the label on spinosad, which is organic, it has in bold letters, highly toxic to bees. So we kind of got to get out of the mindset that organic is always safer because a lot of organic insecticides can kill just the same amount of pollinators. In Tennessee, we're blessed with extension agents in all 95 counties. We have a really great UT extension website and you can go on there and there's a map and you can click on your county and it will lead you to the phone number, the website and the email addresses of your extension agents. 
And since we have a wide diversity of extension agents across our state, we all have different specialties. Some are more turf grass oriented, some are more vegetable oriented, some are more ornamental landscape. We have beef production, we have uh, small ruminant production, hay production. If you've got something that's growing at your farm, we probably have some extension agents who can help you with those questions. But in Tennessee, we're blessed with 95 counties full of extension agents that can help. And this all comes from the University of Tennessee. It's a combination of University of Tennessee and Tennessee State University. And what about in other states? They have the same programs, don't uh, yeah, they? Yeah, each, each state has it differently. Now, some states don't have central uh, located extension agents in their county. They may have one extension agent who may answer all the questions for five or six counties. They mm -hmm. may have districts or regionals or whatever. So but in they, Tennessee, we are we have, you know, a lot. <laughs> that's awesome. So they might not be able to make a house call like you Correct. just did. Correct. <laughs> but they're good with emails and things. If you have questions in the garden, it's always best to start off with an email, especially if you've got a really good high quality picture. I can't tell you how many poor quality photos I've got and I can't even tell what I'm looking at sometimes. You're so not if you even are, sure if it's a spider. It could be a spider and I think uh, here recently I got a picture from a lady who was inside through her mesh screen a, a, a bug on a tree and I couldn't really see what I was looking at. We have a lot of invasive pests that have made their way to Tennessee and, and Wilson County and Smith County privet is a really big invasive pest. I have a lot of privet here. Chinese privet, right? Yeah, Chinese privet, Ligustrum chinensis is is pretty bad. We don't have as much kudzu as y'all probably have over here. We don't have a lot of English ivy. English ivy is, can still be sold in stores. A lot of people are just putting it in mixed container ornamentals and then kind of throwing it out at the end of the year. We have a lot of other invasive pests that have kind of started filtering in. I almost wonder if some of these will be banned in the next, next few years. Yeah. Right for pear seedlings, we see them popping up all along the interstate. So if oh. you're driving down the interstate, you see these white lollipop shaped trees that are blooming white in the springtime. That's a it's a calorie pear seedling which popped up off these Cleveland Selects, these Bradford pears that were supposedly sterile 40 years ago and now we're kind of seeing the benefits of these lovely landscape trees. Oh I've taken so, I took oh, out yeah. a foot and a half diameter tree. They are bad and I almost wonder you know When's it gonna stop? When are we gonna stop selling these things? But we still have people planting them in their yards. Poison ivy is found in pretty much all 95 counties. Poison sumac is in less than 10 counties and poison oak is in less than 10 counties. You can find a map online and actually see the counties. And I think poison oak was only in six or seven counties, but most of those are in really, really swampy areas. 95% of the questions that we get in our offices are actually poison ivy. Right. But they can, if you cut them just right, they flush out, they can actually turn into a shrub. And a lot of people get them confused because they'll see them growing up a tree and they kind of mimic what that tree looks like a little bit. And we don't realize that it actually is poison ivy to begin with. It can become a huge... Oh yes, it's a woody tree. And I have, I was saying earlier, I have it on both hands right now from mowing the other day where I hit a patch of it and blew it up on top of me. And so, it's awful. Yeah. So in other words, there's just nothing we can do. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are some sprays. There are some woody ornamental sprays. I visited a farm here recently and the lady had bought a farm that was kind of forest floor like this and the entire forest floor was covered with it. And she wanted hiking trails and it was going to be starting off with some type of a woody or ornamental herbicide starting to, to knock it back so that she can actually have trails that she can enjoy on her property. Good. Hey, let's go down and just take a look at my grapes. Yeah, that's fine. Before you go. Did well, you? A Japanese beetle right here eating. Well, see, I um, I went by, oops, I dropped it. I went by this morning and I picked them off, but um, I, you know, you can never get them all. What do you recommend for Japanese beetle? It's difficult when you've got fruit already this far along on it. I'm not sure there's probably going to be a lot of recommendations for that. But let me encourage you to go to our residential horticulture website called uthort.com. We have a spray schedule for fruits on there and it kind of tells you when to start cutting off on those. So it'll say apples, pears, peaches, and you can go to the grape section on that spray schedule under uthort.com and it will kind of tell you what are the options for that. So what are labeled for Japanese beetles and grapes? Uh, and that would be kind of the first place I would go to is look at that spray, spray schedule online. Well, okay, we've identified the Japanese beetle. That's the damage that it does yeah. to the leaves, which obviously draws nutrients from the fruit. Yeah. But, um, and it's interesting because sometimes these growers 
we have some fungal issues that occur on the fruit where water sits on the fruit and they want the Japanese beetles to come through and clean off the foliage to allow the fruit to have sun on it to dry it off. So some growers use Japanese beetles for a few what? weeks yes, <laughs> to clean off foliage so the fruit can be exposed to more sun. So some people don't want every leaf on there. Some of the more commercial growers will go through and use them sometimes. That is interesting. So I'm not going to worry so much about those, but what I am worried about is the the grapes that are going, they've got a bird spot on some of them. It could be anthracnose. Is that how you say that? Yeah, anthracnose. <laughs> and we have, we're, uh, we've got some black rot that will actually occur on fruits also. And it's really interesting to me. Um, maybe we can find Yeah, if you, if you go under the wire up there, now you're kind of tall, so scoochie way down. Now I was thinking you could see it better in here. Well, that's stink. So that's actually, we have stink bugs also in Tennessee and there's stink bug damage too. That, that's what that is? That's the stink bug wherever he went to. Did you see it when you picked it up? Yeah, he was oh. just here. Oh, um, okay. But we, we was have- Was it light gray or was it dark? It was a uh, light gray. So we get some anthracnose pressure and we get some black rot that will kind of mummify the fruit on grapes. So you'll see some problems with fungal issues on grapes in Tennessee just because it's so hot. Well, I thought that's what this was. That's not though. It Is could be you... anthracnose and I, it's kind of hard to tell because a lot of these fungal issues that we have, they kind of mimic each other a little bit. So it's kind of hard to say this is for sure 100% anthracnose or I black see. rot or whatever the case may I be. I see. Because there are a number, if you look up diseases on grapes, there's probably plenty of university publications online to see <laughs> pictures and things like that. And if you look at them, they, a lot of them look really similar to begin with. But yeah. a lot of the times, back in France in the mid 1800s, they would use a like a copper sulfur mix and they called it Bordeaux mixture. You got any idea why it does? No, I was looking to see if a vole had chewed up the base of it. So sometimes on these newly planted fruit trees, mm -hmm. we'll have voles go through because they kind of look like a, a, a tailless rat. And they'll go through and chew the base of a stem off newly planted fruits and girdle it enough to kill it really quickly. Mm -hmm. I had an apple tree last year, but luckily it was enough to, it survived this mm -hmm. year. Yeah, uh, let's see, what do I have over here? I think these are two, these these are two are pears, apples. right? These look like, this is a pear here. This is cedar apple rust. I can see that from a mile away. Oh gosh. Oh yes, you know that has just re recently happened. Yeah, and a bagworm. I don't see those on apples much. <laughs> That's a bagworm. Yeah, if he's alive, he'll squeeze out like toothpaste. So, Did it? Yeah, I can see. Oh yeah. <laughs> Did he's it right. squeeze out? Yeah, he's dead now. Oh wow, is it a real worm? Yes. A caterpillar? And it, what it does is it kind of sends out this weird little, so bagworms will get all over. We normally see them on conifers or evergreens. So they'll come out the bottom and they have this weird little bitty string, kind of like a spider, and they'll blow with the wind and go to the next plant. So we see bagworms on Arbor Vitae, Leland Cypress, and Junipers. Well, they'll get all over one, they drop out late, Mar or late May, early June, and they just go with the wind and go to the next plant. Oh, wow. Take off all the leaves. Oh. So is there anything to be done about this apple tree now? Yeah, I would let it ride right now because cedar apple rust is, it's just going to be around, to yeah. be honest with you. So I'm not going to have any apples, right? No, you, it should have already had fruit on it that are the size of silver dollars okay. or, or bigger at this time. But we have cultivars of apples that are cedar apple rust resistant. So we always encourage people to start with those. In Tennessee, zone seven, where we're at. Let's see, this is not one? I don't know. It still has well, a tag on it. Obviously, it's not one. <laughs> no, obviously not. This, this is, is yellow delicious. Well, I think I planted this because it will... Just pollinate a lot of other ones. Yeah. Crab apples will too. Okay. So, we have three cultivars of apples that are pretty cedar apple rust resistant. Liberty, Freedom, and Enterprise. And we have a lot of southern derived apples that do better in Tennessee. So it's almost, you got to go find some of these weird heirlooms that are kind of endemic to the southeast. Arkansas Black, Hardy Cumberland, which Hardy Cumberland, if I remember right, was developed by UT like 100 years ago. Wow, so I love was, that. How do I find those? You're going to have to go researching some of these weird heirloom nurseries. And there's a few of them in the southeast. There's a couple of unique groups on Facebook 
Okay. NAFEX, North American Fruit Explorers. Okay. And Southern Fruit Fellowship, SFF. Oh, a lot I like of those that. are heirloom apple pear fig collectors. Oh, so perfect. whenever I was buying some apples and pears from my farm a couple years ago, I was looking for the ones that were discovered in the southeast uh -huh. because if they were bred up north, Michigan, Wisconsin, forget it. Forget it. Honey crisp, okay. Fuji, developed in Japan in the 40s, not gonna grow in Tennessee. Right. Pink Lady. It's a cedar apple rust magnet. Okay. So if it's a common apple tree that you see in the stores, you probably cannot grow it. Well, that <laughs> yellow delicious is the most common, yeah. probably. Yeah, it looks I, good. I have I some ready almost. I do, I do. I what saw. What kind of corn is that? Do you want to walk through there and tell me which one's ready? Yeah, this one looks. Is this been hot? No. Okay. That would have made for good TV. Kind of like I don't know. That one looks ready right there. Well, I'll take your word for it. What is this corn? This is um, an this is an heirloom corn that my friend has developed over so ten it's a years. So corn? Is it sweet? Yeah. Okay. So very sweet. sweet. So normally, whenever we're actually looking for corn to be harvested, we look for the silks to be kind of dried up, and a lot of these are not ready, but we have a few that probably are ready to begin with, and it'll be interesting to see how this one comes along because. We normally like good husk fill on it and we like the tips to grow all the way to the top because usually that prevents worms. And the first thing I did was I kind of felt around up here and it was really loose. So it may be interesting to see if we find some worms in this. But do you care if I pull this one, Not Kay? at all. So we'll pull this one and see if it's, if it's a little early, that kind of gives you a starting point. And sometimes whenever we're researching these crops, you just need to pull some to see if we're getting really close. Kind of like a little baby white corn. Mm-hmm. So, I would eat that. I will. So whenever you, uh, so we're kind of looking for that stage where it's in kind of a milk and it's got some, some water, some juice inside the kernels there. Mm-hmm. This one looks like it would probably be edible today. Well, I'll eat it uh, for sure, but, but how many more days do you think on based on this experiment? Majority of these other ones still have some time, so you can see that the silks are pretty well brown on most of the on the tip of it that's what i was looking at right there the rest of these silks i would probably go another week seven to ten days and come out and pull another test ear and actually see what you're dealing with okay great that's interesting a little white corn sweet potatoes this is a neat garden thank you so i see your peanuts here <laughs> yeah i that's something else i wanted to ask you about because last year i banked them up with really good garden soil and and then i was told by a longtime farmer he says oh peanuts like poor soil so is that true pe so peanuts used to be a huge crop in the southeast and it's interesting because university of tennessee for the first time in probably 80 years planted their first trial plot of peanuts this year in jackson tennessee on some of their more commercial type ground and peanuts were huge, and we still have a lot of peanut farmers in Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia. And it's almost like they thrive a little bit on really loose, sandy soil. So we were normally looking for those farms that were along riverbeds, creek beds, mm. and things that would sometimes flood. Sometimes the problems that we have here in Middle Tennessee is our soil can be a little bit too hard whenever it gets dry. Oh, it's starting, it's cracked. It. You look yeah. at it, it's cracked right we now. We just need a good rain right now. Right. So. I think we're going to get one tonight. But my question is, do I need to bank it up? To cover up the peanuts so normally when pe when peanuts are dropping down their flowers it's called pegging okay so they send out a flower and i started to see some of these flowers right here you can see them actually coming on right now oh yeah so they send out these flowers and they kind of shoot those flowers back into the ground to, to develop these underground roots that we want the peanuts for that's what happens the yeah. flower goes back into the ground it kind of sends out a weird little shoot it's called pegging okay yeah. I just, I'm growing so many different things, it's hard for me to learn about everything. Looks great. This, this is my absolute favorite uh, uh, herb and flower for beneficials. Look hyssop. at the, look at the bees on this. This yeah, is hyssop. anise hyssop. Yeah. And this overwintered. That's what I loved that about it. Hyssop overwintered? It was, okay. it was right there last, That's last cool. year, right in the middle of the cornfield. I had corn on it. It was at the corner of the cornfield yeah. last year. Uh, I've got heirlooms all over. The, this is a uh, Hutterite and Rio Zappe beans. They're not marked. It's just in my head. <clears throat> well, you can tell a significant difference in those two. Looks like that one's going to be running. Yeah, I know. Runner, maybe. I know. And I, I, 
I watered them this morning and they just kind of got beat down and I thought, okay, well, hopefully they pick back up. They weren't that beaten down until I watered them. They look good. I've had a lot of deer coming in here. You can see all the deer tracks. They were coming through the fence there. I adjusted the wires. You see all the, they landed right here. Yeah, deer are aggravating. And I think I need to, uh, to thin my okra yep. one more time, yep. right? How yep. far apart should okra be? Uh, probably. So okra itself needs to probably be anywhere from four to six inches apart on plants. And okra is one of those things that thrives on neglect. So it's uh, in the hibiscus family, dry, full sun, it does fine. If you can't grow okra, you shouldn't be gardening to begin with. <laughs> That's true. Yes. <laughs> Made her laugh. Um, stink bug. We... That's a brown marmorade to stink bug right there. Can so, you hold, whoops, it's gone. Yeah. So it's I'll gone. put that in my pocket if you want. Okay. Um, so brown marmorade to stink bugs will pierce tomatoes. Let's find one that may have damage on it. Okay. Um. I just picked all these up today, so they're going to look bad for until after the next rain. Well, I don't see any. So one of the newer invasive pests that we're having issues with on tomatoes is the brown marmorated stink bug. So when the tomatoes start developing that red color, they're starting to get ripe, the brown marmorated stink bug will come through because it's got a mouth that looks like a straw and it will pierce a little hole in it, suck a little juice out of it, and then that whole area will rot over time. So sometimes when you pick a tomato, you, see, you may see a little yellow dot. That's more than likely where the brown marmorated stink bug has already punctured it. So if you go, th the rest of the fruit's edible. Cut that one out and throw the rest of it away. We've kind of got to get out of the way of the fruit has to look perfect for it to be. Oh, I, I don't <laughs> worry about that. But what about uh, what about spraying them from for this bug? If the fruits are really starting to develop well, you're really limited on what you can use. And I would probably encourage you to go back to that UT Hort website. Okay. We've got two guides on there. One is a synthetic guide, and one's an organic guide for okay. fruit and vegetable production, both. So. When you go to that UT Hort, you can type in fruit plantings and it will take you to the fruit tree spray guide. Okay. And then when you go to type in organic versus synthetic, it will give you organic options and synthetic options. Okay. I was just going to say that this P here, is, this is the same as this over here, these two rows. This is all something called wild goose pea, which is an heirloom that's been in my family for over 100 years. I have some peas that my granddaddy, he, they were still in pill bottles after he died and he marked them. Lady Peas, 1987 crop, Butcher Knife Beans, 1989, and all those jars sit on my desk. Cause, and I planted some last year. Did anything come up? 40 years old, most of them came up. Oh my goodness. Which is awesome to me. And those Lady Peas, though, they're about the size of, uh, half the size of an eraser on a pencil. And so I they're just tiny. And I imagine my poor little grandma shelling hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of those peas. Yeah, well, she didn't, she didn't have the computer to distract her from, no. from work. <laughs> she also had 10 kids. Oh Very my, wow. Those, I didn't plant one sunflower seed over there. Wow. That's from the sunflowers that dropped seed last year. Yeah. I planted them there, there last year and they, the whole area is larger than last year. It looks, this is a neat little piece of paradise you got here. Yeah, let's walk up here. Um, I might have something else interesting. This is all cucumbers down here. I have, uh, this first section is lemon cucumber. Yeah, I've and, grown lemons before. And then about from there to there is telegram. Yeah. Or telegraph. You telegraph. Get that from Baker Creek. No, I didn't. Oh. I didn't. I ordered some rare heirlooms and, and this one on the back is called Black Chinese. Okay. But this is my biggest nemesis. Do you have anything to say about purslane as a weed? <laughs> the hiccup with purslane, and I have issues with it too, is pulling it up before it ever sets seeds. Because those plants have it, it feels like in my head millions of seeds once they actually flower. Now purslane is an interesting crop because it's it's a succulent. You can go six weeks without rain and it's never going to become phased by any type of drought. If you have some type of a wheel hoe or something like that, it would be chopping it up and keeping it constantly chopped before it ever sets flower. Because once it gets started, it's going to be a beast. I've been trying to do that, but it's I'm I'm very close. I have a lot that I've got to get up. Well, I understand. I, get out of I there. I have problems with them too. And some turnip greens coming in there. Well, this is um, actually not turnip greens. It's uh, black mustard. Oh, okay, mustard. That was my cover crop. Yeah. And so every mustard plant you see is cover crop coming back. 
butternut or something? That is kusha. Have you heard of Southern Heirloom kusha? Oh yes. So oh. kusha is one of those things that a lot of heirloom people would make sweet potato pie out of and you really couldn't tell the difference between sweet potatoes and that kusha. I thought it was pumpkin the comparison. No, it's it, also sweet potato. Well, sweet potato pie, pumpkin pie, kusha, they're all, if you add enough sugar to anything, it's going to kind of <laughs> be the same way. So That's in our right. county fair, we have a, a largest squash category. We always have one gentleman that brings a huge kusha every year. And some of the white ones that he grows, they have to be 60 or 80 pounds. And I thought, wow. how? who eats that much kusha? That's well, no one. Look at this, look at this massive sunflower that fell over. Uh, I lost some recently. Man. Look at that. That's crazy. That's like timber. Yeah. That went down. It's getting hot. So I'll just run through real quick. This is, um, Henderson baby limas. Yep. And these are um, Ford hook? yard long. Yard long. And these are, this is a blooming vine. Uh, I so forgot that. Looks the, like butterfly pea. It, that's what it is. Okay. Very good. Oh, you're good. And there's one that's t that, twice blooming and one that's once blooming. Yeah, so that, that butterfly pea is a really unique plant. Uh, I've grown it a couple of times in my garden because the the flower, if this is the blue one, it's is. probably the bluest thing you could grow in the garden. Whenever wow. I think about uh, how cool it looked in my garden one year, it was just phenomenal. Fantastic. But blue butterfly pea weed. And this pea is vine. heirloom cow pea. Yep. And I've got way too many here because they get huge. Oh yeah, they do. <laughs> should I should I take out half of those? It probably would not hurt, but yeah. I would let them ride right now because we're going to take over this here pretty quickly and they'll drop those bottom leaves. Oh, I see. Okay, I, I like you've used that term. Let them ride. Do you do you have do you know what this is here that I've got started? Do I know what this is here? Hold on. Um, no. Can you tell me? Artichoke. That's artichokes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> if you have success with them, let me know. Well, I, you know, I grew them in, in California. They're absolutely yep. stunning. They're not the typical yep. one, and it's uh, the seeds were from Baker Creek. Um, I've got a lot of heirlooms in here. I've got a lot of <clears throat> fruit over here, as you can see. I picked up, I picked up all these plants yesterday yeah, after all that great. wind and rain. And then I thought things aren't crowded enough, so I put a row of <laughs> zucchini down the I middle. Think this is a good, you know, picture of how we can grow a lot in a small space. So when you are when you think about it, there used to be an old book by Mel Bartholomew called Square Foot Gardening, and he was kind of encouraging people to tighten things up. But I think this was a pretty good example of how we can grow stuff beside each other. And a lot of these things, if you research just companion plantings, a lot of these things really go well together. Yeah, well, I didn't do the research. No. Did I do okay? No, I think you're fine. <laughs> this is my helper that's done a lot of the heavy lifting around here. This is a pepper that he's developed over about a dozen years. And Sweet or hot? Hot, hot, hot. This is the Hutterite again, and I just planted... That's a, that's a shelly bean, isn't it? Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. Okay, it's not too... The green part's not too good to eat. Yeah. Yeah. It's supposed to be good for chowder. Okay. They are actually where the people call Hutterite. Okay. Well, and so that's their chowder bean. And uh, I'm going to be making balm from the... Is that calendula? Uh-huh. From the flowers. Yeah, that's cool. And what else? What else we got going here? Well, I got a whole insectary over there, but the but the watermelon's just going to run it over. Yeah. Any thoughts on hazelnut? So we have a guy in Wilson County who's tried to grow hazelnuts for a few years also, and he's never had a successful crop. Oh, no. And before we really uh, plant a bunch of stuff, we need to probably find someone else who's trying to grow some of those things. Hazelnuts are one of those things that are just not probably going to make in Tennessee because it's too hot and too humid. Oh, wow. Because I got them from Illinois, which yep. is also hot and humid. Yep. So I thought they might. And I just had these uh, white eastern pines planted, yep. two down here and one up at the top. And then I've got three pecan trees that I just, I don't water them at all. They, yep. I just have to depend on, upon rain. Yeah, and that, they look like they're fine. Pecans My, do fairly well if you can beat the squirrels. Any thoughts on the diseases? So we've got three main blights that affect tomatoes. When people call and ask the office, they'll say, I've got blight on my tomato. Well, that's a broad term. We've got late blight, early blight, and southern blight that really affect it. Then we can kind of go into some of the wilt diseases such as verticillium. But when we're looking at blight diseases, if you're walking through a row and you see a tomato wilt overnight, 
look at the base of the stem where it goes into the ground and if you have a white mold around the base of it that's southern blight no saving it got it it's soil born pull it out i think i already had one i pulled it out you may have it, it wilted overnight it does and I didn't it kills look the plant shuts off water flow and it dies the second one is early blight does that does that affect uh, peppers too yeah because i got one over here i'll ask yep. you about it so early blight you'll actually see black dots on the bottom leaves and those black dots will have rings inside those leaves i don't think this is it but it's it's pretty well dark spots with rings kind of like the rings of saturn uh-huh Oh, that's usually soil borne also and it's caused by water mm -hmm. splashing soil and the soil getting on top of the mm -hmm. leaves so one way to prevent that break off those bottom leaves put down some type of a mulch mm -hmm. which you've kind of done with this trying to prevent that but we have a lot of the newer cultivars that are early blight resistant so we, are they indeterminates yes some of them are okay there's a pretty long list online and then late blight usually is kind of brown gray patches all over the entire plant all over the entire plant i have that in california it's yeah, pretty so disgusting we well, have those so what do you think this is i don't know we got some bacterial spots that can affect some of these tomatoes mm -hmm. i don't think this is early blight or i don't think it's late blight or, or southern blight it could be one of the bacterial spot diseases uh-huh for the most part, it may not be a bad idea to go through and break off those bottom leaves and try to push it up. Yeah, I need to do that. <laughs> There's a lot I need to do. <laughs> uh, blueberries. Yeah. So blueberries are almost done. Last year I had a great crop. I had the it's whole a really healthy looking plant. I had the whole co the whole thing covered. I actually added a couple of plants. I've got this this uh, pressure of this yeah, maple. maple tree overhead with big roots going underneath. So it kind of starves out the water for the these first few you know you still got big fruit on that one yeah i need to i need to eat Ooh, i need to eat that that's a huge fruit do you know the variety of that one of this one no mm -mm. that one i did it was on that label that oh, got okay. chopped up <laughs> good um anyway uh i'm just at a point now where i need to change things over yep. in my beds cabbage yep I pick cabbage one. The bugs. I just planted this. This is basically Thai basil, Italian basil, and there's Tulsi in there. Yeah. And then some mums and don't a pepper. Know what Tulsi is. I, d I have a great video on Tulsi. I'll yeah. send you the link. It's a fascinating. We have a we have a small nursery in Wilson County called Tulsima Gardens, and it's owned by an Indian, and he he sells a lot of the of ethnic type plants. It's oh no really kidding. Interesting. Mm -mm. So he has a lot of the gingers, and when you said Tulsi, I thought, I wonder if you got that from him. <laughs> I, I'm going to go over there. Yeah, Tulsima Gardens. He's very active on Facebook. Okay, cool. My onions didn't do well. I think because they're in the shade and I could not keep them watered. Onions need to be planted the last week of February in Tennessee. I did that. Okay. <laughs> but it could it, be the shade then. Yeah, they just didn't. They never took they off. Over, they're ready to go up, come out. Yeah. I need to just take it out and start over. Uh, let me just show you my side garden real quick. So if I plant my edulis in the ground, which I really want to do because I've been lugging it in and out of the garage for winters, do you think it would survive? I think this is one of more of those tropical type plants that you're probably going to have to continue to drag in and out. Especially since last December we hit below 32 for five straight days. We had that Arctic freeze come through. We, we probably could have skirted the hardiness zone for a couple of years with this, with some mild winters, but I don't think this is something that's long-term going to live in the ground in Tennessee, zone seven. But the maypop is... Wild. So that's the Tennessee State Wildfires maypop. That's Passiflora incarnata. That one does fine in Tennessee. Do you like the way it tastes? Nope. Okay. That's what I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> I've tried it a couple of times. And it... So the biggest hiccup on these squashes are squash fine borer, and I had an email this morning of a guy had a big zucchini plant like this and it had wilted overnight and you can go to the base of the stem where it goes into the ground and you'll see a little hole where the squash vine borer has drilled a hole and, and killed the plant depending on the severity of it sometimes people will take their pocket knife and dig them out right and then over here this is all volunteer that's a volunteer sunflower and i didn't i never planted sunflower here can you imagine wow it's 12 feet tall. It's like one on steroids. Look at the blooms on that. I know, it's crazy. I guess it's a lemon queen. It's the only one I know that, that blooms is, multiple. There's so many cultivars of sunflowers now, it's crazy. 
Anyway, um, I just wanted to show you this one kusha here. This is volunteer from yeah, that's last a big year. One. You got another big one right here. Oh my gosh, yeah. This one's, I think, a little bit. Did you bit. eat Mm hmm. Okay. Yeah. What do you do with them? Make pie. <laughs> I make pie. This is a, this, in there, in here, no wait, in here, somebody sent me some se seeds and they were um, traced back to Daniel Boone. Yeah. But I planted 10, 10 or 12 seeds in there and only one came up. So. Good Tennessee name. But a lot of heirlooms. I'm, I'm focusing on a lot of heirlooms. Yeah, there um, are a lot of neat heirlooms out there. I think that one is the one I the brought from California, and it is a purple, uh, the purple, what's it called, purple? Uh, Mission? Or no. LSU purple? No. It's very common. Okay. Um, There's brown turkey. Brown turkey. That one's I'm already sorry. in Tennessee. That's what I thought, but so, I'm afraid to plant it in the yard because look what happens with the other one. It dies so, all the way to the ground. It does, so figs... They're kind of hardy to zone seven. We have some that are hardy to zone six. Now that freeze that we had in December killed them all back to the ground. My, I've got relatives who've had fig trees for 20, 25 years and that last December wiped them out to the ground. But figs are really interesting because sometimes they'll put on a crop at the beginning of the year if those leaves, uh, those main branches overwintered called Nabriba crop or if they come back from the base of the ground, sometimes they'll flower and fruit in the fall. Mission, or no, excuse me, Magnolia, Celeste, brown turkey seem to be the best ones for Tennessee. What we about have, Chicago we, Hardy? Chicago Hardy would do fine. We have a guy who has success with a yellow one in Tucker's Crossroads called Desert King. I love Desert King. And I just planted Ishii Green at my house this year, oh which my. is a, a big green one. There's an, another one. UT has one called Italian Green, and it's a larger fig. But it, it's done well for them for the last 10 or 12 years. I like figs. If you eat enough, they're diuretic and they'll clean you out too. Well, the thing is, uh, I don't get many. You know, when they grow in a pot, they just don't produce that much, they right? Don't. Ideally, if it's one this of those is, hardy ones, they need to be in the ground. This is calamond and lime, yeah. which is uh, actually, I get, I do get fruit off of it. Yeah. And There's I made. Purslane. This is actually, believe it or not, I actually <laughs> not planted that. This is tall purslane. Okay. It's not the red one that spreads out yeah. like a floret. That's interesting. So, Lemon. This is kefir, uh, kefir. Yeah. Thai lime, uh, and it's prized for the leaves, not the limes. Okay. So the Thai use the leaves in cooking, and it's re they're really flavorful. Mm. The problem is, um, in inside my big problem is. Um, uh, the white uh, fuzzy stuff, what is it called? Mealy, mealy bugs. Mealy worm. Yeah. Mealy bug. And sometimes on that... those mealy bugs, I can see some on it right now. You can take a oh, Q-tip with a rubbing alcohol and dot them on there. I see one right there. Squish it. Thank you. So. Um, those are um, <laughs> fashion. That's not I, blooming I, I, serious. I, 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 no, it's... Uh, <laughs> oh, dragon fruit. Dragon fruit. Yeah. And it looks... Have you read fruit on that? No. Okay. <laughs> no. Mine in California was 20 feet tall. I was going to say, they didn't it grew, I let it grow up. I let it grow up a tree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I just took some cuttings off so that oh. I could carry it with me. That's cool. And you know, figs root, I see. But they get real root. shriveled up in, in the pot in the, in, in the winter. They don't like it. And they got out here with this rain and they blew up like yeah. balloons. That's awesome. Yeah. And I need to uh, up pot them and... Uh, you know, I planted some raspberries up here. Was that a good or a bad idea? I've killed idea? raspberries twice. You what? I've killed raspberries twice. In oh, Tennessee. you may not be the person to ask then. Yep. <laughs> I've planted some black ones. The question is, do deer like them? Yeah, they probably will. So this is uh, goji. Yeah, goji and I, should do fine. Well, I dug it up and it almost killed it because yeah. I cut into the taproot. Yeah. It has a long taproot and there's another one there. But now I got so many weeds here. It's not a Bermuda. What? I don't know. I'm not. I've not been successful to raspberries, so I'm not the person. Okay. This is. This is all the raspberry. I oh, know. Wait. Is this something different? They'll put on a, a crop. You, if you, some people will prune them back to the ground and reflush them out for the fall. Oh, okay. Would it? Do you know what this is? Because this, this is not the raspberry. I didn't even. That's a hickory tree. Oh, a shag bark? Seedling. Yeah, one of these shag barks is okay. squirrels put a seed there for you. Thank you. Thanks so very much. Okay. Do you see any? No. 
Yeah, I do. There's one. That's kind of small. Oh, it is. Yeah. And here's another one. It's just fascinating. I love fossils. Almost looks like these marks are... Well, that guy moved. Do you have anything to say about raccoons eating the corn? <laughs> no! <laughs> um, raccoons. My neighbor turns on a radio and plants the corn right by his front porch. <laughs> yeah, I've been trying to use a radio in my barns to keep the rats out because I raise sheep. It's really interesting to me. So raccoons are going to know the day that you're going to go out the next day and pick your corn. They're going to go through and strip it clean really fast. And it's mostly trying to beat them to the corn. Do scarecrows work? Uh, not really. Do how about uh, fake snakes? I've seen people use that flailing man to scare animals out of the garden. You know, they send up at used car lots. See that flailing man? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that yeah. what it's called? I don't know. But it, that has a generator. It's got to pump air. It's got to pump air and you'll have to run power to it. But I've, I've heard people having success with that in their garden whenever they're needing to scare something away. Uh, but I don't know what a flailing man costs. I'll have yeah. to research that. Too. Yeah, that's... So, so it, there's really no hope. <laughs> no, I think there's hope. And the thing is, you, you have to pick it a day early. You need to pick it... Yeah, pretty much. I, they already know. They already my know. Kay's going to be out here in the morning, boys. Come on. And the, the raccoons do. are not stopped by my four strings nope. of hot wire, are uh, they? Nope. nope. How do they get in? Uh, uh, they're going to crawl under whatever, and they can get into a hole that's about the size of your fist. Oh, my. So they're really good. Okay, so I'm going to be sleeping in the good in luck. the garden with they my pellet gun. a tent out there. It'd be fun. A what? A tent out there. You got your little sleeping bag out there. Yeah, well, maybe, maybe my, no, no, my corn's almost ready, actually. In the next week, I'd watch it. I was going to say, I could, over my arch, yeah, I could sleep under my archway, but it's not covered yet. <laughs> you know. People might call about a homeless person sleeping in her corn. Yeah. <laughs> hey, if you enjoyed this video, leave a comment below. Be sure and like the video, share with your friends, and find ways to support this channel underneath each video. Thanks so much for watching. I'm going to go get a cold glass of iced tea and relax. See you next time.